I think, therefore I am. But I'm thinking all the time, and I don't know who I am. Am I? Are you? I'm in the middle of nowhere, and it's a good place to be. Welcome to Just Nowhere with Dr. Samuel Zinner. Uh, could you tell the audience uh, who you are, where you are, and what you do? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on, Samuel. Um, yeah, so my name is River Canise. I live in the United States. Um, I mostly do software for work to make money and such. Um, but for the past year or so, I've been um, dabbling in a number of other pursuits, including starting a podcast and um, recently managed to get a philosophy paper published uh, by the Essentia Foundation, which your feedback was very helpful for. So thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, that essay is in part on the Ruli ad. And so, um, yeah, I think we're going to be talking about a lot of a lot of those topics and some related topics today. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Excellent. Um, I should say that I'll put a link right in the description below right, to your article. All right. So the article that you had published with the Essentia Foundation, um, right, I think there's two main components in there, uh, overarching right, fields that would be idealism, a la Bernardo Castro, and then Stephen Wolfram's Ruliad. Uh, but before we, we jump into that, <clears throat> uh, do you have any more information on the Ascentia Foundation? Who is associated with it right, that the audience might, might be aware of? Yeah, so um, the Ascentia Foundation uh, was started by Bernardo Castro, who is basically leading the modern uh, renaissance in metaphysical idealism, I would say. I think it's fair to say that. Um, mm -hmm. He basically got a PhD on his work that's kind of centered around this idea that all life, but particularly um, intuitively, like human consciousness is a form of dissociated mind within the God mind. And this has sort of become the new baseline for um, the idealist perspective, uh, at least among people who are part of this renaissance. Um, so he and then a number of other uh, relatively well-known modern um, idealist philosophers uh, started this foundation and they run it. Um, and they just, the whole goal of the foundation is to promote idealism. So mm -hmm. uh, is Ian McGilchrist on their board or is that just... I do not know. That's a good question. It would be worth looking into that. I believe he's had some stuff published with them. I don't know exactly how affiliated he is. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Very good. Well, then, uh, to start this off, then, uh, let's get into idealism. Can you give us right, your understanding? And if you want to, even even your modification, I mean, if, if you uh, don't agree with everything Kostrup says, but uh, could you summarize uh, his basic uh, message, right? If people are going to find his, uh, they're going to find dozens of his, if not more, uh, talks on YouTube, for instance, right? And so, wh what is what what is this version of idealism, right? That that he is promoting and is becoming popular. Yeah. So I would say one of the most impressive, uh, one of the things I appreciate the most about Kastrup's work is that he really comes at the topic with a very high degree of academic rigor. Um, and what I mean specifically by that is he really looks at a bunch of different fields, specifically um, fields in science. Like he has a very interesting interpretation of quantum mechanics. Like he pulls in, you know, fundamental physics, um, a lot of cutting edge, like neuroscience related stuff or like psychology related stuff. Um, and really comes at it from a lot of different angles and makes a very academically rigorous argument um, for the core idea of idealism, which is um, that reality exists in the mind of God or the mind of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most beautiful and powerful things that this does for me is um, 
gives you know the scientifically minded person a very clear you know reasoning and like all encompassing reasoning from all these different fields saying pointing at like hey there's something bigger here there's a transcendent like unknowableness to, to that like all of the evidence is sort of pointing to in a bigger way um so i feel like i'm sort of going off on a tangent here but no, not at all, not at all. I, I think i think the way like um his his core argument is is basically that we you know if all of reality is in the mind of god um well it raises a bunch of questions right like well why does it seem like we're in this physical reality and um you know how do you how do you explain that so we kind of get to the dualist question here mm -hmm. uh, the dualism question here and i think castrop's argument is the most powerful one that makes it very clear at least to me that idealism is a framework with it, it's the framework the philosophical framework with strictly the fewest assumptions and it's a big assumption of course which is basically that consciousness exists but you can't not make that assumption no no matter how materialistic you want to think about things you can't deny that consciousness exists as a conscious being we can't really define what consciousness is but um basically any other interpretation at least to me looks like a dualist interpretation and i think he does the best job of making a, a really clear you know one assumption basis um framework for philosophy mm -hmm. uh, how, how would he evaluate dual aspect monism i know there's more than one version of that but the the basic structure of it how, how would he how would he uh, evaluate it so maybe let's um uh, what how would what would be like a basic uh, definition for dual aspect monism? All right. Well, uh, it's it's associated with with a number of of modern uh, philosophers, to be sure. But all of them recognize that there are ancient precedents, right? Like the the Hindu Upanishads, right? And I I imagine Kastra, right, has you know investigated texts like that. They have these concepts of of the spirit or mind, however we want to to uh, label it, um, and right the the world out there, right. And but there's something um, unitary underlying all of the uh, diversity, right. And uh, now, so to make this a little more concrete, right, um, an example of this in the modern era would be from Wolfgang Pauli. And he did a lot of work with uh, uh, Carl Jung, Gustav Carl Jung, and they together developed right, what's usually called uh, uh, Pauli's uh, dual aspect uh, model. And that is uh, that we have this uh, binary right, of mind and matter. Right? And, and we can use synonyms for both of those, right? There's a lot of synonyms for them. But let's say uh, mind and matter or consciousness and matter, right? Now, the, the basic tenet is that both of those emanate from something that is more primary, right? So on a more fundamental level, there's one, there's, a, there's something that is one, right? And that's sort of beyond our access, right? Beyond conscious access. So our con so consciousness uh, and materiality, right, are two uh, sort of on a secondary level, right? They're they're like two manifestations, right, that have um, emanated from this something that is more primary, right? And yeah. So uh, Castro would call that the God mind, I suppose. Uh, right, and so you just yeah, you just kind of answered the question there. It's like. So I think the the ideal the only difference between looking at things that way and fully embracing idealism is that the idealist perspective is that more fundamental thing essentially is just a greater form of mind or of consciousness and whether you know whether or not that's really true for me it's it's beside the point um, the the power of thinking of things that way is that there's sort of these inherent unknowable limitations that we already have when we think about our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be 
the best metaphor that we have um, towards this greater unknown. Um, and and I, I, I mean, I would argue personally to understand like the unknown fully of our own consciousness, we would really have to understand the unknown at large. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't necessarily be to say that understanding our own consciousness would mean we would understand the mind at large. But I think they're both fundamentally, there's a fundamentally unknowable boundary within there either way. So I, I at the end of the day, for me, it's, it's much more about intuition than it is about like truth, because I think we're into this realm where certain things cannot be known. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, I, I certainly would agree with that. intuition, uh, the importance of it, because uh, many people, right, many experts have made this point that consciousness is basically self-reflective, right? It's when we're talking about human consciousness, right, with a fully developed ego, right? So, and um, so it's pretty difficult to fully examine oneself, you know, one's own consciousness, if it's self-reflective, it's sort of like, how do you uh, uh, get beyond the image in the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Or how do you get behind the mirror? There yeah. are just certain bounds, right? To, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah right. it's like, it's an ongoing process. It's not really something that you can say, oh, I've done this and now I understand it. It's like, we're always doing this. We're always observing our own consciousness. Right, oh, all right, all right, it's sort of, uh, uh, the idea that there's this absolute truth out there and that um, our knowledge, right, continually, we hope, continually approaches it more closely. Okay, right? so... so our, our closer approximations. Yeah, right. But right. Not a full grasping. So the, the idea of truth, um, the idea of there being this like ultimate truth or ultimate reality that we're all grasping for, um, I, I would argue that that's not actually, to me, it's not the most useful idea. I think it's more confusing than it is um, helpful right. in a what lot word of ways. Would you use? I would use wisdom or, or intuition. Um, I think uh, basically wisdom is the highest form of intuition and um, true. So from the idealist perspective, um, we exist in this God mind and we are a dissociated part of this God mind. So we, we are in a sense, a part of God. Mm -hmm. God is living through us as us. So in a sense, our subjective experience is truth it is part of that God, right? It is part of that divine truth. And I don't know, you can now, th this isn't an argument that the word objective is useless. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a, from this perspective, objectivity is a measure of consensus. Obje so there aren't objective truths per se, but we can say that there are things that there are more and less consensus about, right? So for example, the physical reality, um, that's sort of a baseline of what I would consider to be pretty much trivial consensus. Like there's very little dispute that like, you know, this is a wall behind me right here. We would probably both mm -hmm. agree, even though you're looking at this through a screen and this could right. all be simulated as far as you know, like mm -hmm. that's a pretty trivial consensus, you know, reality that we can share. So just kind of to loop this back around to the conversation of like dualism um, versus idealism. Um, the, one of the big questions that like people coming from a more materialistic interpretation have when they uh, come across the idea of, of idealism is this question of why does it seem like there's this physical reality and we're all separate beings and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you look for a second as what it would mean for us all to be part of this God mind and just for your consciousness to be one dissociated part of that God mind and mine to be another part. And then there to be this larger mind that all of these parts are within. And there's a fundamental unknowability about the nature of that larger part, not to mention the nature of the parts that we ourselves are. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you, if you imagine that, then 
all the physical reality is, is whatever baseline of consensus we have between parts of mind within that God mind. And then there's a lot more consensus we can have, right? We could both agree that, you know, this is a nice looking picture, but that's mm -hmm. a qualitative thing. That's not a physical truth. Right. That's, that's a more higher level subjective consensus that you and I may share. I would argue it doesn't look particularly complete, but it's, you know, pretty aesthetically appealing to me. Um, so consensus goes far beyond the physical, but I basically like to think of physical reality as a baseline trivial consensus. Um, whereas the materialist narrative sort of puts, inflates it to be this thing that's much greater. Like somehow, if you think of, if you think, for example, or specifically of consciousness as being an emergent property of you know, particles in a void mm -hmm. of, you know, just physics, mm -hmm. then we're putting the material reality as primary and fundamental and almost somehow more important. But if we recognize for a minute that you only ever experience the physical reality through your consciousness, mm -hmm. then your experience of the physical reality is a subset of your conscious experience. So the consciousness is much more primary. Right. Yeah, we don't have to get into this particular point, but um, when on this topic, I usually like to throw out there right, that, um, you know, in relation to m the philosophy of materialism, right, upon which most of modern science is founded, right, uh, uh, there, there's a big question there for me, for materialists, and that is, tell me what matter is. I don't think anyone can. Right? It's right. Just, for me, it's just as mysterious as consciousness, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, the main point here is uh, what I like to refer to as the epistemological barrier, and that is just the simple fact that you just mentioned. Our knowledge <clears throat> and experience of uh, physical matter, uh, the, the, the world, whatever we want to call it, right, is it's only through our consciousness, right? That is, that is a barrier. It cannot be overcome. And uh, I believe I mentioned to you in an email, right? I listened to uh, a recent interview with uh, Tyson, and he was um, mentioning that scientific instruments like the, <clears throat> excuse me, microscope, Mac, uh, or telescope, right? These replace uh, faulty human perception, right? Which is human consciousness. Now, granted, that was an interview, so maybe he would use different language in a scientific publication. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, right, I had to chuckle the, at this formulation that, all right, uh, right, before we, we just had our, our physical eyes, right, to look mm -hmm. at Jupiter, right, before Galileo, right, uh, made his telescope. And so, uh, you know, with the naked eye, you can't see uh, those four largest or four brightest uh, satellites or moons of Jupiter. But uh, Galileo saw them, right, uh, through his telescope, right? So the telescope, right, sort of uh, for, for deGrasse Tyson, um, either sharpens or, he says, replaces the faulty human uh, perception. But mm -hmm. uh, right, it just immediately throws out the fact that even the data that is collected through microscopes, telescopes, uh, or whatever other uh, scientific instrument or tool you're talking about, it has to be processed through our consciousness, right? So you, you, there's no escaping right. this epistemological barrier. So yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on, on what Tyson uh, is implying there? Well, I mean, it's clear he's coming at this from a very materialistic perspective, right? He's saying, mm -hmm. you know, this is basically a bunch of assumptions and then particles in a void. And then we are these things made of particles within that. And we have these little instruments attached to our head that have a very limited ability to gather information from this world outside of us. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, that's a useful perspective to take um, in terms of like building models that predict, you know, all the things basically standard science has done for the past yeah. few centuries, really, um, or, or even longer. But I think one of the most interesting things about Kastrup's work is that he actually goes to the bottom and says, these are the assumptions we're making in materialism, right? Mm -hmm. This is all the evidence that we've gathered 
on the basis of materialism, you know, making materialist assumptions, we've done all this science, you know, science and science um, to gather all this evidence. And the mm -hmm. evidence is pointing that, hey, we actually have some answers to some of these assumptions, uh, a lot of them. And really, we can boil pretty much all of this down, at least very intuitively, to one assumption, which is just consciousness exists. Mm -hmm. So I think once you sort of invert things and you and you don't assume there's a physical reality and then we're just like conscious beings within it, within it, but rather that there's a bigger picture here. There's basically a God mind and this physical reality is a mental model within that, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of inverting those. Um, especially when you look at things like quantum mechanics, and I love Castrop's interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so I'll, I'll throw that in here. Basically, it's about understanding what it is to be an observer. Mm -hmm. And when you look at things from a materialistic perspective, you just hit a ton of paradoxes. But if you go, come from an idealist perspective, basically what quantum mechanics is telling us is that the relationship between the observer and the observed is part of how that actually interacts. So it, there, it, this, there, there isn't just this physical world that just works how it does and we're observers that just kind of watch it be how it is. We're playing a part in that. Us observing it affects that. The relationship between us as the observer and what's being observed affects that. And from an idealist perspective, that makes perfect sense because if you think of all of reality as mind and we're part of that mind kind of exploring and also playing a role in generating what we experience and share with other mind, forms of mind around us, that's much more intuitive. And so with that perspective, we look at these instruments um, you could say, like, you can question, well, is a measurement device an observer? Mm -hmm. It's not conscious. So, no. But then why does it have, why, why does what measurement device we use where change the quantum effect? Well, it's because that measurement device is part of the relationship between the observer and the observed. Um, and so those are like the high level philosophical implications that I think we can see from quantum mechanics right now. Um, and and I, I think it's really interesting to, to pay attention to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk to him sometime about like the, the kinematic effects of special relativity uh, and how that would be approached uh, right through the lens with the prism of idealism. Um, I don't know, uh, have, have you heard him talk about that subject like time dilation of the Lorentz contraction? Um, I cannot say that I have a specific um, thing in mind on that, but I, I'm mm -hmm. sure he's thought about it. I'm sure it can be found. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as many, I've spent many hours looking at his work, but um, I wouldn't, I can't say that I've seen it all or that I would remember uh, everything I've all seen right. in that all high right. detail. But. All right. All right. Uh, fair enough. I, uh, so, I, well, well, what I will say is that Part of how I look at this is through using Wolfram's work. To me, these sorts of questions about fundamental physics and, and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, that's where Wolfram's work helps me as like mm -hmm. someone who was very much steeped in the kind of traditional materialist uh, scientific mindset mm -hmm. kind of bridge the gap to idealism. In, All right, uh, well, let's, go really there. let's go there now to, to Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram and his Ruliad. All right, so initiate right. us. What is the rule we had? Okay, so in my essay, um, which, is, which is an essay on idealism, I focus a lot on Stephen's work, and I talk about the rule he had, but I want to go ahead and say that a lot of the biggest insights I draw are actually from his old book from over 20 years ago called mm -hmm. A New Kind of Science. Yeah. So most of my insights are already drawn from there, but there are a couple key things where the newer um, physics, pro the Wolfram Physics Project mm -hmm. um, offers a few new insights. Um, but basically the Ruliad is this idea of the set of all possible computations being run on all possible initial conditions. So this is a very like computer science sort of idea, but it's also like very much at the limits of 
computer science and mathematics. And then basically the, um, the claims Wolfram makes, and this goes back to a new kind of science, is that there are patterns we can start seeing here, which seem to naturally or, you know, naturally develop over basically through this process of emergence, um, things that look like fundamental physics. So it looks like we can just run this trivial program. And if you run it long enough, suddenly you have this simulation that looks like it has both general relativity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And I think the Rouliad is a big part of where the quantum mechanical aspect of that comes in, um, because he's talking about these hypergraphs and um, when computations result in the same state, then you collapse those into being uh, the same part of the Rouliad. So to hit um, that's part of his argument for how the Rouliad can also explain quantum mechanics to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the basic idea. And then one of the core things, I think, one of Wolfram's core, I would say it's a theological claim, but I don't think mm -hmm. he necessarily frames it that way, um, is he says, basically, as soon as you have computation, you have the Rouliad by default. You have the concept of the Rouliad by default. What I think he maybe doesn't see so clearly is that you're assuming a mind within for that to, you know, for for that concept to exist within, right? So to me, I hear the mind of God. As soon as the mind of God basically invents computation, by default, you have this set of all possible computations run on all possible mm -hmm. initial conditions. Yeah. Um, so... For me, I find that very intuitive from an idealist perspective. Mm -hmm. So you think of mind of God, you, you, you connect it immediately with Kastrup's uh, mind at large wording? Right, right. Yeah, uh, I mean, and Kastrup, Kastrup is, com uh, is comfortable with that wording. He'll use mind of nature, mind of God. Um, he generally, you know, stays away from the theological as much as possible because his work is based off of a lot of scientific evidence. So you really don't need to go into like using that language where um, people think you're talking about something superstitious. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think ultimately he recognizes there is like a divine unknown component to what he's talking about. And so he, he is comfortable using the word God as long as we understand what he means by that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I think this should be, should be, uh, you know, a general understanding there, right? Einstein talked about God and uh, belief in God even, right? So it is very well known that he's referring to, quote unquote, the God of Spinoza. And there's other ways that uh, we can talk about this, right? They're, they're not the, the, the theology, right? From Sunday school or from synagogue or, or from a mosque or something, right? So this is sort of something uh, more philosophical, I think. Well, I think I think um, kind of the beauty of idealism is that it doesn't say a lot about any of the specifics. And then if you come at really almost any religion from the perspective of idealism, mm -hmm. it's like this is a great story. I can see the value. I can see the wisdom in this story. And if you don't come at it from idealism, if you come at it from materialism, there's this huge temptation to say, oh, this story is a historical account of a specific thing and it has these specific implications. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you compare the, those two interpretations, um, I would say the idealist perspective is often more insightful and in making less assumptions. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, uh, are you able to uh, tell us how the work of Gregory Chaitin like overlaps with that early work of Wolfram, or uh, have you studied that? Um, so, yeah, I have been interested in um, looking into Chaitin's work, um, particular. Well, so, but I'm I'm not as familiar with Chaitin's work as I am with Wolfram or Castro by any means. So I'm kind of just like pulling things out of a uh, murky water here when I'm, sure. when I'm talking about his work. That's One thing I do know for sure is he has an incompleteness theorem, which I, you know, when I learned about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, that blew my mind. So um, I'm a big fan of that. I have a pretty good understanding of his incompleteness theorem. 
Um, and then beyond that, I've been looking into his metabiology work. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, what that gets at is the same question that I approach through looking at the concept of universality from like a Wolfram uh, perspective mm -hmm. on things. And so that's, that's, I would actually say that's really the crux of like, how, how, of bridging the gap between Castrum and Wolfram is what Chaitin refers to as this metabiology, like this source of creativity, this, you could call it the divine unknown. I often call it the divine unknown. It's sort of this loophole in any seemingly deterministic framework mm -hmm. or explanation you have. There's always sort of this little loophole. And that's also what the incompleteness theorems are revealing, by the way. No, mm -hmm. like, no, you can't make a system that's bulletproof that's actually useful, like an, in a high level space. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a little loophole where it contradicts yeah. itself. And then you're saying, well, maybe I should like come up with a different framing and then different framings have different insights and they all have a loophole. Yeah. Um, none of them are bulletproof. So to me, um, Chaitin's work is a lot of exploring that area, exploring that ter territory, mm -hmm. um, sort of this idea that God is a programmer as well. And I think that's sort of him and Wolfram talk about that, which works perfectly, especially with um, how I approach um, Wolfram's work from the idealist perspective, because I assume there's a God mind, right? Mm -hmm. And then I assume that God mind invented computation. Mm -hmm. And then once computation was invented, I go with Wolfram and I say, we by default have the rule yet, but we have a this is where I differ from Wolfram. I assume we have a nascent version of the rule yet, right? So we have one where we're just exploring all possible directions, but it hasn't already been computed. Sometimes Wolfram talks about the rule yet as if it's already all been computed. And I think there's merit to, to looking at that. But for me, mm -hmm. it, it just makes it very, like, why am I experiencing time as like linear and all that? Like, for me, it's useful to think of like the Rouliad is playing out and we're on that frontier of like it expanding, right? We're one part of that Rouliad somewhere kind of as it expands. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah this is uh, pretty deep. <laughs> well, so um, we well, haven't actually talked about universality and the implications of that yet, but we're sure. like coming at it from multiple angles now. Sure. I understand. Um, well, as, as far as uh, God being a programmer, right, this, this is a wording from uh, Gregory Chaitin. Okay, um, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, he's uh, in an unpublished uh, essay that he wrote uh, for a book I'm co-editing. Um, well, I should mention the title. It's uh, On the Origins uh, and Applications of Language and Number, right? So he starts off his essay. Uh, which which uh, centers on Leibniz's um, binary system, right, that he invented. Or he starts off by saying, uh, for Pythagoras, uh, God is a mathematician, right? Uh, but for Leibniz, God is a programmer, right? And so it's the difference between um, working with numbers right, and then working with algorithms, right? So that's the difference. So the, the, the algorithm right, is what the programmer uses, right? And so uh, one can see the applicability immediately, I think, right, to Wolfram's work. And of course, um, I think everyone, well, maybe not everyone, but uh, most people should know, right, that, that uh, Wolfram and Chaitin are, are very uh, close friends, right, for decades now. That's so, really interesting, yeah. I've, yeah, I've seen some talks with them both. And yeah, so there's definitely some mutual, quote unquote, influence, right, between them for, uh, for several decades. All right. Yeah. So, all right. What else do you want to tell us about uh, your your concepts and arguments in your essay? Well, yeah. So let's keep going with this idea of um, God being a programmer, and mm -hmm. then and then tie it to universality. So, um, from the idealist perspective, we have a vague, but at the same time, clear and succinct um, idea about what God is, right? Mm -hmm. But we have some really big questions, um, namely some of the ones we've talked about so far, such as like, why does there seem to be this physical reality? But then other ones such as 
why does this physical reality seem to be so predictable in so many ways if there's this like God mind that can just do whatever it wants, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think the idea of God being a programmer and like sort of looking at Wolfram's work and the intuition you find there really helps to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, because it on this, on the one hand provides this baseline for patterns, you know, repeating patterns. Um, there's variation, but there's a lot of repetition as well. Um, if God's a programmer saying the universe is going to, you know, expand and grow in according to these algorithms, then the predictability makes sense. But it says another very important thing, um, which is that God is still God and God's the programmer and God can change the code. Right. right. And so this is where like, you've kind of lost pretty much anyone coming at things from a materialist perspective. They're like, okay, well now you're just talking about something else. There's this whole other God and, and you're, you're saying basically anything can happen. Mm -hmm. But I think Wolfram's work is incredibly insightful on this front. Um, particularly with, the concept, this is where the concept of universality comes in. So, and I'll just talk about cellular automata here because it applies just as much mm -hmm. to the really ad as it does to them. And they're a mm -hmm. bit simpler to visualize. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at one of these irreducibly complex patterns um, and anyone not familiar, this is what Wolfram's work is all about. I highly encourage um, reading a new kind of science, reading his blog posts on the, on the really ad and such. Um, but basically, uh, a, an irreducibly complex program is one that produces this ever more complex pattern as you run it. And there's no, there's no way that you can write an equation to predict what a certain part of that pattern will look like without running the entire thing, right? The interesting thing here, or one of the really interesting things about Wolfram's work is that he discovered that there are multiple patterns that have this quality to them. There are multiple programs that produce irreducibly complex patterns, basically, but they can all simulate each other. So you can start with one and then set up the initial conditions such that on a higher level, like if you zoom out and look mm -hmm. at things on like a bigger grid where say like a hundred squares would be one square on a normal cellular automata, it looks exactly like this other one. And that other one was already irreducibly complex. Mm -hmm. What that tells us is that even if we were to able to, you know, assuming our physics was generated from a pattern like this, mm -hmm. even if we were able to go like use some sort of microscope to peer into the inner workings of physics and right. start to see these complex patterns and say, oh, you know, Wolfram was right. Like, all this physics is being produced as a high level emergent ph phenomena from these complex patterns. Even if we do that, we can never know we're at the bottom because any pattern we see can be simulated by an even lower level pattern, right? right. So this is sort of the, the loophole where kind of creativity and God being the programmer and able to change the program comes in, I think. And it's also where the idea of free will comes in for me. All right, uh, right. Uh, yeah, we've discussed this subject, right? Um, I think that, at least for me, it's pretty clear in Wolfram's work, that at least for Wolfram himself, right? Um, there really is no free will, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with that or disagree with that. I'm just saying I really see him um, pushing that in his work as that's a part of his work, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and right, so uh, how do you see that his system would have to be modified in, in some way in order to interject free will? Or do you no, think I just not seeing a, a larger picture as you are or? or what, yeah, what you I, I mean, I, I imagine that if he were to take the ideas of idealism seriously for just as a, you know, just as a thought experiment mm -hmm. and for a moment uh, or, you know, spend some time, it would probably take a significant amount of time to, you know, really give that an honest um, frame shifted interpretation. Mm -hmm. But if he were to kind of 
assume idealism is true as a baseline and then think about the implications of his work, I think it would be clear that that's not what it's implying at all. It does not imply that there is no free will. Um, not to me, because and, and it, it's this idea of universality that that says that to me. Um, so, you know, from so I'll just try to paint this picture a bit more clearly from um, from the perspective of idealism. We're all part of God. So God God is living through me in a very small part. I'm a part of God, and that's the free will, right? That's the God being the programmer. I have. Maybe I don't have the ability in myself to rewrite the code, but maybe I can cast a vote, right? And if enough, if enough of the like sub parts of the mind of God say, oh, we should change this, then that's part. So, you know, maybe that's a very unorthodox or, you know, idiosyncratic interpretation of free will, but there's something there. There's some, there's something very much there yeah. still. And I think, so there are two things I want to talk about here. One is the sort of inverted logic of adding layers to the bottom of the stack of reality. Mm -hmm. And then the other is to consider Wolfram's argument, which is basically that the Ruliad some, in some way does away with that by being all things all at once. Um, so help me remember that I want to do <laughs> both of these two things. Um, so first I'll start with the inversion logic. So basically, if you, if you just kind of imagine that reality is generated from a cellular automata-like pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And then you recognize that when we get to the bottom, it can still just be a simulation of a deeper pattern. And that that deeper pattern can make arbitrary changes as it unfolds that we wouldn't be able to predict from what we think is the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're all casting a vote on what that next layer is going to be. It's very counterintuitive to think that we're mm -hmm. adding code to the bottom of the stack of reality. Right. But I would point out it's just as unintuitive to imagine that time is emergent. But a lot of scientific thinkers are talking about things in this way. I mean, if you look at string theory, if you look at any of these fundamental physics theories, most of the modern ones do not talk about space and time as in the four dimensions as we perceive them as being, you know, fundamental at all. They're talked about as being emergent. emergent. Okay. So the assumption that like time should be intuitive or like di directionality in general should be intuitive, mm -hmm. I think, there isn't any frontier of thought that is holding to that claim at this point. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's that. And then in terms of what I would, uh, what my understanding of Wolfram's argument is um, about the Ruliad sort of being this deterministic, like almost as if it's already computed sort of thing, I would point out a couple of things there. Mm -hmm. One is you're talking about something that's like, infinity in so many different ways right right so if you just look at something as being everything that could ever possibly be all at once it's like are we done like no like no that it i don't i don't think you have to assume we're looking at it that way i think it makes a lot more sense to look at it as we're part of this thing that's growing and we're playing a part in that growth and now how we're playing that part is by casting that vote to add the new line of code at the bottom. Now you could say, well, um, you know, that's just what it looks like to you as one observer within this Rulia. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. But also like, what's, what's the difference? Like what, what point are we getting at here? No matter what part of the Ruliad you're in, you, you can never access the very beginning of the Ruliad because that could always be simulated by a bigger Ruliad, right? It, whatever you think looks like the beginning of the Ruliad to you, because it's infinity in every possible direction, is still something that could just as easily be simulated by another bigger Ruliad. So I think we can choose to invert things and, and just kind of recognize that our experience is always from our consciousness as the baseline. Maybe that's maybe that is the baseline. Maybe we're always just going from there, right? And so 
maybe the idea that we're constantly casting votes to change the code isn't so crazy after all. Well, um, I, I think that the two ways of looking at this, you know, what's, what's involved here is like uh, the model you are presenting. Uh, maybe, uh, I could be off here, but maybe what we're talking about is the difference between a, <clears throat> a three, Right, three-dimensional <clears throat> growing uh, universe, right, uh, in contrast to a, a four-dimensional space-time block world, right? So I think that Wolfram, and here I'm not taking sides, I'm ju just for the sake of, of, I think, explaining the difference between your model and then what Wolfram seems to be uh, proposing, because to me the Rilead is, is not always clear. I think he's still working it out. Right, but, yeah, I think he's focused on the physics aspect of it. Yeah. I don't think he's really given the philosophy a super. I don't think he's focused on it for several years, which may be yeah, what, what he needed. I, I know he's, uh, he's 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 like sees the need, and and he actually does right. have some philosophers and theologians even working on. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what he does. With that. I, I would love for him to work to talk with Castro, obviously. But yeah. yeah. But uh, I think what well, from his the model that as he uh, presents it really at it seems to me to be like more like a four dimensional block world, right? And and so for you or, or for the sake of the audience, right? The the difference between the the growing universe and the block uh, world, right? Is uh, all right. So uh, there is presentism, right? And so this would be the opposite of what Wolfram is proposing: presentism, and that is that only the present exists. Right, the past uh, used to exist, doesn't exist anymore. The future ha does not yet exist, but it will exist when it when we get there. Right, but the only thing that's real is the present. Right, so that's sort of the default, uh, right, for common sense. But the four dimensional uh, block world, right, is uh, really Einsteinian, but uh, augmented by Minkowski's interpretation. And that is that the past, present, and future all have equal ontological weight or ontological amplitude or status. The present, right, uh, the past still exists. The future already exists, right? And the only way, the only reason that we, we can't appreciate that in our consciousness is because of limitation on the part of our consciousness. And uh, this was explained by Hermann Weil classically. Uh, uh, that what's going on, according to him, was, or so how can we have a block world where uh, the entire history of the universe from the beginning to the end is already there, right? But we're only aware of, you know, this one slice. And that is because uh, he's, Vial said that our consciousness is, as it were, crawling along the world line, right? Uh, 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 you know, our world line. So... Uh, that world line means, let's say, take your life from, from beginning to end. That's, that's your world line. Right? And so um, consciousness is only aware of th this, this four-dimensional reality in which the future is already there and the past is still there. Yeah. Right? Uh, only second by second. Right, and so it's a it's a limitation of the conscious mind, right? And um, so, right, I, I don't want to get into the physics of it, but you know what is usually invoked to try to justify this, right, would be things like the kinematic effects of special relativity, like time dilation of the Lorentz contraction. So the Lorentz contraction, right? You you <clears throat> let's say you, you have a, a two by four piece of wood, and you project it, you throw it, and um, Right, so the, depending on the velocity that is moving, you will get a different length measurement, right? And so now usually that's, that's considered a deformation because for, for, for kinematic reasons. But what uh, Minkowski and that way of looking at it would say is no, the reason you have a different length measurement is because you're measuring different 3D slices of that four dimensional a uh, piece of wood, right? This in motion, right? Um, but in any case, so it's it's uh, also been called, the block world is also called the eternalist model, right? So it's, yeah. it's like an eternal 
model as opposed to uh, time flowing. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, so it sounds like to me what you're doing is saying, no, let's let's look at the Ruliad through the prism of presentism, right? A growing. Sure. I mean, so yeah. I have very specific reasons for doing that, right? I have very specific motivations for why I'm exploring all this. And as I said before, it's not about truth to me. All right. It's about wisdom. All right. uh, it's about wisdom and intuition. And I experience myself as living a meaningful life. Um, through a timeline in a more or less three-dimensional physical space, but primarily in a conscious space that mm -hmm. seems to have infinite dimensions. Um, and I see many people around me falling into psychological traps, such as doomerism and nihilism, um, which are, in many cases, direct results of atheism and such, which are highly correlated with um, deterministic interpretations of things. Um, so to, to me, all this stuff where you're saying, you know, it's already it happened and you're just kind of like this thing playing it out for some reason, but basically there is no reason at that point. Um, and I like to think that I have reason in my life. I think I will live my best life and I do that. So while I think it's useful to consider these perspectives in like a purely like esoteric, you know, um, just from a logical perspective, um, and I think they are very useful and they do give us insight about basically how unintuitive things a lower level than we see them can be. I think there these framings are useful to help us get an intuition, uh, an intuition for how unintuitive <laughs> things can be in a way. Right. Um, but yeah, my motivations here are very much um, grounded in trying to help people in my community um, get out of nihilism, uh, overcome doomerism, this sort of stuff. Um, so I don't spend much time with models like that, where, you know, the basically mm -hmm. the assumption is there is effectively no meaning because it's already happened and it's been done and you're just kind of playing it out for no reason basically i i like to frame things such that um we do have agency we do have meaning in our life um and i think there's no evidence against that and i think castrop's work really puts the nail in that coffin as far as i'm concerned because this is the model that has the least assumptions based on all the scientific evidence we have. So, right, you, you, you're referring to idealism. Idealism, yes. Right, right. Yeah, because I, um, because I could imagine, right, the the 4D, well, um, the 4D model, right. Uh, there are versions of it, right, where its its proponents, right, would not. And of course, most of these proponents I'm referring to are not modern, right? They're pre-modern. Uh, the proponents, uh, right, would not find it meaningless at all, right? They would actually derive ultimate meaning from it. So, okay. so I would, I, I would, at least throw that out there that there's, there are, I think, possible ways, right, to see an eternal model and actually to find meaning in it because it has, you know, it, it was. A meaningful model, right? <laughs> in I mean, modern times, I wouldn't say my model is not eternal. Uh, you know, so right. Just, well, I'm I'm say uh, I'm using the word eternalist in that very narrow and cautious right. sense. Right? right. But what I'm referring to is, for for instance, like uh, this. There's this verse I I always like to appeal to, right? In in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tehillim, in Psalm 139, where the psalmist. And, and I'm not doing this for religious purposes. This is just a, an example of, of how this eternalist model, right, doesn't have to, well, it can be very meaningful, right, for pre, for pre-modern people at least. And that is that um, the psalmist talking to God saying, uh, God, you basically, the idea there is you wrote all my days in a book or a scroll. Right before I breathed my first day, right, and so uh, that's that. Uh, it, if one doesn't subscribe, you know, to that way of thinking, of course, it's not going to be meaningful. But 
I think that kind of evidence indicates that there were people, right, who had this kind of uh, predestination idea, and uh, they uh, they obviously led very meaningful lives. And yeah, today uh, in Absolutely. Islam, right, when something bad happens or something really good happens, right, there's a couple of verses in the Quran they usually quote, which is that uh, nothing happens to you except that it was written in, in the book, God's book, right, before right. And this is very meaningful, right? So yeah. There are those possibilities. Just want to throw that out. Absolutely, yeah. So I think, I think when you look at it that way, you're kind of recognizing that by default, we experience things in chronological, you know, in this life that we're living, in this conscious yeah. experience. That's our default. But we yeah. can look past that and say, you, you know, have faith that God has a bigger plan. There's a bigger story we're playing a part of. And I'm all for that. You know, so to the extent that these are the implications we're drawing from this sort of inter eternalist perspective, I'm 100 percent on board. I think it fights nihil nihilism. So two thumbs up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it's uh, exciting when uh, two areas uh, of uh, intellectual thought right, that seem to be worlds apart are brought together. Right. And that's what you've done in your essay, bringing together right, uh, idealism of a certain flavor uh, and the Ruliad, right? And of course, when, when you bring them together, of course, um, at least the Ruliad gets modified, I think, right? I don't know if the, the idealism uh, is getting modified, but it is modifying our understanding of the Ruliad, yeah. so that's exciting. Yeah, I, I would say idealism gets empowered Mm -hmm. And I would say, I would, I mean, the way I see it is, you know, none of the work that Wolfram and his team are doing is in any way undermined by my interpretation. Um, I would just, it just seems that certain philosophical implications that, um, that Wolfram talks about, I, I think need more questioning. Um, I, I don't think it's clearly you know, the direct result of his work that, you know, free will doesn't exist, for example. Well, it's like mm -hmm. certain formulations of free will, sure, but that doesn't mean there isn't a way that it's like useful to use the term free will. I think there definitely is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so. Right. Well, there's even a, a, a model, right, that's called the, the growing block world, right? So there's uh, even an attempt to inject uh, uh, temporality right, into the eternal model, right, and um, perhaps that's one way of understanding the Ruliad, and I think that, well, maybe, maybe that's overlapping with, with your approach, but, but in any case, it's exciting, uh, because it's a new model, so it's, um, right, a step forward, right, in, I would say, in knowledge, and also in thought experiment, because, uh, and I think here, uh, I find very valuable right, your observation about truth and um, wisdom and intuition. Right? So um, that's what we need. We need the intuition. I mean, we need wisdom right, in, in order to use and evaluate uh, intuition, I think. But yeah, uh, I mean, I, it's not it, always a matter of right, arriving at some kind of truth. It's, uh, we have to be sure. open. To, 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 to forge ahead. Right? right. Yeah. And again, I don't think the word truth is useless, but I think it's often very confusing and sort of like implies like a, some sort of fundamentalism, like there is God's truth. And then there's all these people lying. Well, that would be very anti-idealist. Um, right. Because mm -hmm. the idealist assumption is that everything was created by God. Essentially it, it exists in the mind of God. Um, and at the end of the day, we act on our intuition, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, not so much, you know, any any sense of truth that we have. Uh, it's just yeah. our best guess. Um, well, so. to, to be upfront, that's just that just reflects uh, my own background and training, which was that there is a truth with a small T and a truth with a big T. And what science tries to do, right, uh, is uh, formulate. Uh, well, one thing science tries to do. Uh, is is um, not necessarily to try to prove something is correct, but right we try to um, we try to show 
uh, we try to disprove things, right? That's, that's the scientific method. We try to disprove things, right? And that's how we arrive at, at uh, so-called little truths. But these little truths uh, are little because they are approximations. And the main point is, is that you can never get to the capital T truth. That's sort of like, uh, you know, a metaphor, right? And <clears throat> all, you, all we have are ever closer approximations Right, right. The goal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, more refinements. <clears throat> so when you when you for anyone who like frames the scientific pursuit as like a pursuit of truth, mm -hmm. I would you Very know theological. suggest maybe consider inverting that instead of trying to get down to truth. What science does is gives us new tools to explore new technologies to explore new types of experience through technologies we develop right as we understand things we're able to do new things and to me this is part of this god living through us as us we're exploring and playing an active role in generating the new the next layer of experience space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those two t's too right you you can um also apply those to Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Absolutely. Right. Just, uh, you know, one can, one can use different, uh, you know, wordings, but I like, I like wisdom. Now, if I may ask you, uh, what well, the intuition I understand, and wisdom also, but uh, is, is there a special motivation, right, or background, right, that led you to favor this word wisdom, I mean, which actually is a word that I've, been intrigued with my whole life, actually. When I say wisdom, I mean basically the highest form of intuition. So it, I just consider it a a type of intuition. Essentially, um, intuition is useful for all sorts of things, but like wisdom is sort of an elite class of intuition. You might say something where you're recognizing a truth that's applicable much more broadly something that's kind of just like mm -hmm. almost an inherent property of consciousness like these archetypal stories get at bits of wisdom right because we see them over and over again in all these different stories throughout in you know in lifetimes and mm -hmm. in, in some ways we all confront maybe even all the archetypes in our own way and like that's our story playing out so i think um, kind of seeing those highest level patterns is what I refer to as wisdom. But we can get intuition from th for things at the most trivial level. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the uh, the, the mind at large, um, and then right the the individual minds that let's say comprise uh, that larger mind that immediately brings to mind. Um, I, I think there are right. That basic insight, I, I think we do see it in like uh, Jewish mysticism and Christian mysticism and other, even Islamic mysticism, Sufism. I think they all uh, are using their own languages, right? Uh, but they're all, I think, hinting at that, right? That there is this great uh, mind that's all, in a way, ultimately unknowable, but um, we form part of that unknowability. And uh, there are all types of metaphors, as I'm sure you're aware, right, that each of those traditions use. And within each tradition, there are different authors who use very different metaphors, right? There's the, the light, the fracture of the light, the sparks of light, right, that uh, the one becomes many, right, the light metaphor. But uh, essentially, usually it's this... Um, this great divine mind or consciousness or whatever one wants to call it, right? Um, that is one and that somehow is also many. And, and that's where we integrate, right, creation. Yeah. H have you ever looked into any of that, those, those, those types of traditions? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, I routinely look into these sorts of things in great detail on my podcast. Um, I recently did an episode on Christianity where I dug into, you know, the creation myth, what ar archetypes are, um, a lot of relevant things here. I would say of particular relevance um, when we're talking about wisdom, um, the highest 
form of wisdom that I know of, I believe, is the wisdom to embrace humility. Um, and this is really kind of the core uh, thesis of my podcast, I would say, is I, I, I talk about all, a bunch of different ways in which, in which that can be insightful mm -hmm. and help us overcome these psychological traps of nihilism and doomerism. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to tie in specifically humility, the virtue of humility versus the sin of pride, just looking at things from a Christian perspective. Um, I find I find the Satan story to be really powerful and really helpful to gain intuition for um, the, the necessity and the inevitability of humility. Um, and I think it's really interesting to look at that when we're considering things like the Ruliad uh, mm -hmm. or, or deterministic models in general. I think there's this idea of logical positivism that um, was very popular mm -hmm. in the last century and is still pretty prevalent today. It's kind of this default form of atheism for people who, uh, for ma mathematicians and, and scientists kind of coming at things from materialistic assumptions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is Godel's work here, right? He, he was a logical positivist. Uh, and basically the assumption there is, you know, if we solve math, we'll understand everything, something like that. Mm -hmm. right. And I think when, you know, based on the reading I've done, my understanding is that when he tried to do that, the inevitable result is he came up against that unassailable wall. And that's when he wrote his incompleteness theorem. And he realized, mm -hmm. oh, like, no, <laughs> like that was basically hubris to think we could do this right uh, and I, I don't know that he realized that i think it s sent him into a mental spiral of um my understanding is he became very depressed and and riddled with anxiety after that and i think that's that's the standard arc of a hubris trap right that's where you you imagine that your abilities are higher than they are you imagine that we're able to do without this sort of transcendent like do away with the divine unknown and, and get to an explanation where we can predict everything mm -hmm. and i i think you always hit a wall there so um kind of the wisdom to see through that and and embrace the unknown uh i think is is just a really powerful, I mean, it, if I have any wisdom, that's, that, that would be it, I would say, because that's, I've learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Gödel's incompleteness theorems put the nail in the coffin of, you know, the whole endeavor, the dream, right, for so-called theory of everything. It's just, right, just from the, opinion. from the logical positivist perspective anyway, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, right, right, um, right. Um, I think I think we can talk about a theory of everything, um, but it would have to be worked out within the realm of philosophy. I, I don't think one can do it with, within the realm of physics. Let's put it that way. Now, I would not say. Yeah. I would not say. Not. I, you know. I'm, I would say. It can't be worked out in the realm of science, right? But that's because I, I am using the word science uh, not as most people use it. Uh, uh, well, you're there in America, right? So um, at a university, uh, science, what is a scientist? Well, we have physicists here. We have some mathematicians maybe. Uh, but now here we have uh, historians, uh, literary experts. Those are not scientists. But uh, over here in Europe, uh, for instance, in Germany, they are. These are called the Geisteswissenschaften, the intellectual sciences. So, the, you know, uh, yeah. uh, they're, sci they're scientists also. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, something important to recognize there is that, you know, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, these are theorems, these are mathematical theorems. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of this general acceptance um, in kind of the standard scientific narrative that math is at the core basic basis of reality, mm -hmm. but that's an assumption, <laughs> right? So these incompleteness theorems, um, they tell us, you know, something about the mathematical language in which that statement, you come to that statement, right? 
But if we are to pull implications out of that math language and try to apply them to, you know, our experience, reality, mm -hmm. language of our own consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Then, uh, and I actually wrote this the other day, which is kind of just a fun thing, but I, I, I'm calling it Kinesis Incompleteness Theorem. Um, and this is just trying to do that basically. So what these incompleteness theorems say when you translate them into um, philosophical speak would be something along the lines of, no amount of logic can do away with the source of awe that is inherent and necessary for conscious experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then like kind of one of my poetic interpretations would be like the divine unknown is eternal. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think one implication of, of these mathematical models, whether it's Gödel's incompleteness theorems or, or Chaitin's, right, is, the, is, uh, is an implication of, of humility. Uh, and that is yes. that there are limits to human knowledge. Yes, and there are also limits to any given model. And it, I think also kind of to me, the more like optimistic aspect of it is kind of inverting that and saying, there's always more to learn. There's always more to explore and there always will be. And that's a beautiful thing, if you ask me. Right, right, right. Yes, yes. It'd be a terrible thing to uh, arrive at knowing everything, which it just sounds so right. anyway. And that's, yeah, we, and that's sort of are, the irony. That's the irony of the, um, you know, the logical positivism is like thinking that it would be good to be able to explain everything. And then just right, like, uh, what, are you done? <laughs> like. Yeah, like, What's the point like of living at that point, right? Like Dennett, right? So D Dennett doesn't believe there are any limits to uh, human knowledge, which um, you know, it's uh, just find so so bizarre. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, he's attacked Noam Chomsky, who, by the way, right, is, is a well-known atheist, right? He's attacked right. Noam Chomsky, uh, and he uh, this term. Um, pejorative term was invented to describe uh, a certain belief of Noam Chomsky. This term is Mysterianism, right? And that is there to describe Chomsky's uh, observation, which I think is just common sense, that there are limits. There are some questions that we as a human species will never <clears throat> be able to answer. There's got to be limits because we are not angels. We are embodied creatures, right? So yeah. if you look at a rat in a labyrinth, uh, because it is a rat, right? It has a certain structure to its brain and certain uh, cognitive capacities. Yeah. And it can only handle so many right turns, right? Or left turns. I would, uh, yeah, I would point. actually reframe that a bit, um, which I think might be helpful to people who find that idea unsettling. I think we can say there are questions for which that any answer we find will always have another question in it. Yes, yes. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's getting the same point across. Right. It, well, it is, but it can be confusing because people might think, oh, so there are certain specific questions that are unanswerable unanswer and we've come to the end of learning. But no, we can learn more and then and then learn how to answer that question, but it has another question within it, right? And right, so we right. keep... So one could say there, there, there will be certain... Uh, well, as I say, we hit a certain limit, <clears throat> right? So I do believe that there are certain questions. Sure, we keep on refining, 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 but I believe <clears throat> that there are certain questions we'll never get the answer to. We'll never get a final answer to. I agree. <clears throat> well, yes, functionally speaking, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, <clears throat> and I don't know what any of those questions are, right? But, you know, there are... <clears throat> I mean... One would be, what is God? One would be, what is consciousness? I, I would assume, you know, both of those are essentially unanswerable for the same reason, because you kind of have to know the answer to both to get either. But Right, right. So, yeah, some people would say, as, as you see, like consciousness, that's one of them. So I'm just being extra cautious and saying, uh, being more general, there will be some questions that we can never arrive at a full answer just because we are what we are. And I think that's where the virtue of humility comes into play. And okay. that uh, to deny our limits as a species, right, is like <laughs> uh, to invoke the example you were given is like satanic hubris. Right? It's well, just ridiculous also intellectually viewed. It's just, it's absurd.
Well, on the other hand, um, the temptation towards satanic hubris exists in essentially all motivation. So a lot of people do a lot of really good work by motivated, you know, being motivated by prideful narratives. Um, and then it's just it becomes problematic when they get that answer they were looking for. And it results in them becoming nihilistic because they had right. like utopian yeah. expectations. It's true in Judaism, right? We talk about the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, right? Uh, but it has good uh functions and purposes as well well good can only exist in contrast to evil can it not that's right well but the yetzer hara right the evil inclination right is that you no one's going to want to have sex and, and produce children without it right <laughs> so uh it's just a part of the world we live in right there has to be these certain impulses uh, that if they get out of hand um, right can lead to one's destruction, right? So they have to be channeled, right, in a positive direction. And so that came to my mind because of this example that you were using of pride, right? So there is a certain type of pride that is an impulse that can, uh, right, inspire someone to search for knowledge and it can lead to good results. But if it's not controlled, right, it can go overboard and even destroy someone uh, or even ruin, right, an intellectual model or some theoretical construct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you can go, I think you can have this conversation indefinitely because you can go up a meta level and say the need to control someone's pride is a new form of pride, so. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's an inevitable and necessary part of motivation, I think, uh, that's, how, that's how I look at, at it. Yeah, very good, very good, right? All right, uh, is there anything else you wanna add? I think that was great. I mean, maybe we maybe we do another one at some point, but I think I think this was a great day. So I really appreciate you inviting me on. It's been yeah, great. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed the program, please consider supporting this channel with a donation through Patreon or PayPal. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.